A few years back, Panasonic launched the GH5, a compact form factor camera with decent codecs and bit rates, with accessories available for handling more professional audio, and with the ability to shoot log via a paid upgrade. This meant that it quickly became the go-to camera for everyone from amateurs and budding filmmakers all the way through to professional documentary makers and more, and has been and still is one of the most successful Micro Four Thirds cameras of all time. Moving on a couple of years, and Panasonic launched the GH5S, a camera that confused a few handheld fanatics due to the removal of in-body stabilization in favor of better low light thanks to a new lower megapixel sensor, purpose-built for video. And now, in 2021, there's this, the GH5 Mark II. With rumors of this and the GH6 circulating around the same time, it was intriguing to see what specs and features would be seen in each of the cameras. With that in mind, we'll be taking a look at the ins and outs and the operation of the GH5 Mark II, covering its setup and best options for capturing everything from short videos to docs, as well as dramas and time lapses and using the camera for live purposes, and of course stills. First up, we'll take a look at the exterior of the camera. Physically, the body of the Mark II is very similar to that of the original GH5, albeit some markings changes on the buttons and some fancy new shiny red bits. There's also a reduction in size, but increase in resolution of the rear screen. Other things like a slight increase in dynamic range, improvements in the in-body stabilization, and the inclusion of Vlog L are all welcome upgrades, but the sensor does remain the same as the original GH5. Also, just like the original, the Mark II's custom function buttons on the camera are going to play a big part in your camera's setup. So, you're going to want to make the most of these, depending on what it is you're going to be shooting. The camera allows you to customize the quick menu, main menus, dial directions, and almost all of the individual buttons across the exterior of the camera. Changing these will allow you to shoot more efficiently, allowing you to quickly switch settings, giving you more time to capture that shot. Which takes us nicely onto our different setups for different shoots. Now, I won't be covering all of the different options within the entire menu, as there are a lot of options that, for most filmmakers and photographers, won't be applicable, or options that can be very personal to the user, and what additional equipment or accessories they have. So I will mostly be focusing on the key options for different types of image and video capture and cover the top line details of the other options. For those of you who are familiar with the original, not much has changed in the menu system. So it should be a comfortable system to jump into. And for those of you new to Panasonic's Micro Four Thirds range, the menu is probably one of the easiest to navigate. But if you are struggling with anything, then whilst in the menu, just tap the display button near the card door, and this will give you a quick bit of info on that part of the menu. Although the GH5 II is classed as a hybrid camera, and therefore will do stills and video brilliantly, most users will grab this camera solely for its video capabilities and will rarely use the stills functions. But that doesn't mean it's not something that should be overlooked, as it's probably one of the most powerful hybrid cameras out there at the moment. So, if you're wanting to get set up and ready for capturing some photos, we'll go through these options and menus now. To start off, let's get the camera switched on and make our way down the menu system, starting with stills photography. To access the still settings, your top dial will need to be in one of the many stills options, though you may find that some of the menu items will become unavailable depending on whether your camera is set to manual or one of the other auto modes. With the stills options, we'll start with the top under the page Image Quality 1 and Photo Style. Here, you have various options for picking how your image looks once it's been captured. This submenu of Photo Style is duplicated within the Video menu and in both will allow you to select Vlog or other video-based looks and we'll cover those options later in the video section. On the still side of things, depending on whether you are shooting RAW or JPEG, you'll want to choose something that works best for your workflow. For me, when shooting images, I always shoot in RAW, 
and personally I have no reason to capture JPEGs at all. So therefore we'll just leave this as the standard color profile, allowing me to implement my look during the edit. With raw capture, the photo style you select is almost irrelevant. This look isn't burnt into the file itself, so even if you shoot, for example, in black and white, your raw image will still retain the color information. If your turnaround time for images is short and you need to shoot JPEG to get the images out with minimal to no editing, then make sure you check the different looks for the style of shot you're wanting to capture. Some of these styles will have greater contrast or more punchy colors. You even have the option to create your own styles and looks and save them within one of four presets that you can quickly and easily recall whenever needed. Next up is the camera's metering mode. This allows you to pick and choose how your camera evaluates or sees the scene to allow you or the camera to alter settings to correctly expose the image. This ranges from looking at a large part of the scene all the way through to a single point. In the more automatic settings of the camera, this will adjust either the shutter speed, aperture, or ISO, or a mix of all three depending on the camera settings, and should give you a captured image that exposes that part of the scene correctly. If your selection isn't yielding the results that you'd hope, then exposure compensation can be used to make the shot brighter or darker, or by choosing a different type of metering mode than the one already selected. My preference for this option is to use spot metering, this allows me to make sure the camera is metering for a very specific point within the scene. Following on along the menu, aspect ratio allows you to pick the area of the sensor that the image is captured in. Typically, photographs are captured in a 4x3 ratio, and again, depending on the output or final destination, you'll want to pick the correct one for your needs. The native aspect ratio of the camera sensor is 4x3, so by keeping the ratio selected as 4x3, you'll be using the whole of the sensor and not losing anything in image quality or losing the focal length of your lens. Other sizes that are available within this are 3x2, 16x9 which is typically for filming, and 1x1 which can be used for social outputs. Though it's worth noting, you do have the option to enable guides on the monitor setup. These guides show you an overlay of the aspect ratio while still utilizing the full 4x3 sensor, allowing you to frame your shot for your delivery, but not limiting your shot to that size. So if you want to do a 1x1 one one output for Instagram, you can select the 1 to 1 ratio, and this is what your camera will capture. This is fine for things like products or smaller detail shots, but for bigger shots, portraits or vistas, I would opt for using the overlay to capture the full scene in camera then crop in post, allowing me to move the crop around if something better presents itself, or to use the entire image. Picture quality refers to what type of file the camera is going to capture the images in. The first two, fine and standard, are both JPEG options, with fine being the better quality of the two. You then have three more options, which are the inclusive or exclusive usage of raw images. If you select raw only, this does remove the picture size option in the menu. If not, then both fine and standard have a sizing option, which the camera can helpfully give you a little blurb on what each one means by pressing the display button. Long exposure noise reduction is only useful if you're creating long exposures. But even then, I typically would leave this off as I do my own noise reduction in my edit, as I'd have a bit more control over that function. Now this next option is a useful and often overlooked option within a lot of cameras. So knowing the prime parameters for your camera's ISO is really important. So if you're likely to be introducing noise into your images, say above ISO 3200, then here you can set your auto ISO range. Here I've set it to 200 to 1600, which means that the camera will only operate within that range as 200 is the camera's default minimum and 1600 is the maximum ISO I'd want to use. This option has become a more powerful ally to those shooting in changing lighting conditions where you want the aperture and shutter speed to be firmly set due to either speed of movement or a certain depth of field, but you still want the freedom that an auto setting gives the user. This ups or downs the ISO based on the meter reading of the scene and hopefully will give you a consistent exposure across all of your captured images, even if the sun dips behind the clouds. 
Much like the ISO setting, you can dial in a minimum shutter speed that you wish your camera to go down to when shooting. This is helpful for sports and wildlife photographers if you need to freeze the action. And is also helpful when you're shooting handheld, as even with the inbuilt stabilization and lens stabilization, there will be a minimum shutter speed you'll want to go down to to make sure your shots are still sharp. The second page of image quality isn't something I'd particularly go into myself. Leaving all of these off will work nicely for a majority of shooters. And moving on to the focus page, we can customize how the camera reacts to different focusing challenges. This option allows you to select the different types of autofocusing settings. There are already four presets within the camera, which can be tuned, and each will give you a little description of what they do and what they're best suited for. These options are only available with the camera body set to continuous AF, and these settings will help a lot with tracking different subjects from things like sports, motorsports, wildlife, and other subjects, and will work at focusing on speed of AF between the shots to accuracy of AF between the shots. The AF assist light, well, I'd always turn this off, especially if you're shooting in environments where you don't want to distract or disturb your subject. Focus peaking is helpful for those of you wanting to focus manually or even slightly adjust your focus. It highlights the outline of a subject that is in focus. This outline becomes more intense or pronounced the more in focus or sharper the shot is. It's really handy for anyone shooting manual focus lenses and is something I would always choose to have on for the time I use manual lenses or for when I switch autofocus off on AF lenses. Your options here are to have the peaking on or off or change the settings of it once on. Settings options include the color, sensitivity, and whether you want it active during AFS. For this video, we'll be skipping the flash settings as you'll need to dive deeper into flash photography based on the types of flashes you have and the trigger or release system that you have paired with them. So we'll pick up on the next page, which is called Others. Starting in Others 1 is bracketing. Bracketing is a great feature for things like macro photography and landscapes. This enables a function where your camera shoots multiple shots in a row, changing a set parameter with the camera doing the adjustments for you and triggering the additional shots automatically. Then you'll be able to edit these different shots together to make a single image. Typically, you'd only be able to bracket exposure, but with the GH5 II, you're able to bracket the focus, which is really useful for macro photography, the aperture, or the entire exposure. With bracketing options for different exposures, so exposure, aperture, or shutter speed, these would typically be used in landscape photography, allowing you to capture an image that has a middle exposure, as well as a number of under and over exposed images too, meaning the information in the highlights and shadows are retained, so you can combine these all together in post. With silent mode within the camera, this eliminates any operational noises created by the camera, such as beeps from the AF locking on, or from operating the menu system, all the way through to changing the shutter from a mechanical to an electronic one. Just be aware though, that with certain lighting, electronic shutters can cause strobing within your images. This segment gives you different options for customizing your image stabilization, from the types of movement that you'll be doing through to adding an electronic stabilization for capturing video. An example of how you would use one of the image stabilization settings would be with motorsports. When shooting motorsports, your camera movement is typically linear. So from left to right or right to left with very little vertical movements. So you'll want your camera and lenses image stabilization to counteract any vertical shake that you might inadvertently introduce. You'll also want the combined IS to allow smooth horizontal movements like panning to make things easier to keep the subject in the correct part of the frame and not have to fight against your camera's IS. Burst rate allows you to select how fast or how quickly each shot follows the previous one when the shutter button is held down, either high, medium, or low. Just remember shutter speed will dictate the amount of actuations within a given amount of time. The GH5, like many of its predecessors, has a built-in intervalometer, so you're able to shoot time lapses with relative ease. Now it's worth experimenting with this function if it's something that you are going to use often, 
or in a professional capacity, as things like shutter speed and frequency of intervals do make a huge difference to your end result. Also, remember to turn off anything auto, such as autofocus, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. In this submenu, you can select things like when you want the time lapse to start being captured, how many images you want it to capture, and how long each interval is. This option can be completely customized to capture as many images as you need in a given time. So that's pretty much it for all of the photography side of the internals. We'll come back to some more of the photo side of things when we get to the general settings and button layouts. Now we'll cover off the video settings for the camera. I'll be going through this as to how I capture things here in the UK, as it would differ from how others may capture things, for example, in the States due to frequencies. If you turn the top dial to the little video camera with the M next to it, you'll have access to only the video options and controls. Regardless of what you're capturing, only ever use the manual setting as there are things that you just don't really want to leave to the camera when shooting video. Much as the same as the stills photo style option, this will allow you to select the different looks for filming in. For quick turnarounds with minimal post work, standard, cine like V2 or even like 709 would be your best options. For greater detail retention, Vlog L is the one to go for, but this will mean more work in post. And again, you have your custom options that you can use too. Metering mode and ISO sensitivity are the same as the stills options, so we won't go over those again. With SynchroScan, this allows you to change the shutter speed or shutter angle of the camera to match that of displays and screens that you may be filming, which will help reduce or remove the strobing effect that screens may cause. The SS stroke gain operations allows you to pick whether you operate your camera for video using shutter speed or shutter angle. Personally, I prefer shutter angle. Firstly, it allows you to set and forget, meaning that no matter what your frame rate is, your shutter angle should always be 180 degrees and you won't need to change it. Whereas if you're using shutter speed, you will always need to make sure your shutter speed is adjusted to be double the frame rate. Also, shutter angle is a more professional option and something you'll find as a default on productions and more professional cameras. So it's a good time for you to start understanding shutter angles. With the image quality two page, again, we'll skip by this one. The file formats can give you lots of different options for quality and what you can do with them during the edit. For the GH5, MOV is the most comprehensive format and gives you the most recording options. Image area should be left at full, making use of the full sensor. Recording quality allows you to select the correct quality for the piece that you are filming in varying resolutions, bit rate, and bit depth. As a general rule, I'll always aim to capture at 10 bit 422, no matter what I'm shooting. It gives you the most amount of information to play with as it's less likely to suffer with things like banding, especially if your final delivery output is to somewhere like YouTube where the video would be highly compressed. Then it's data rate or bit rate. Remember that the higher this is, the higher the requirements for the card is. And if your card isn't fast enough, you can risk dropping frames, losing clips, or not being able to record at all. Other than that, it depends on what you want the output to be or what your client wants the output to be. So 4K or Full HD. And the final option within that is the frame rate, being either 25 or 50p for slower motion clips. With any of these settings, you can add them to a quick list if they are settings you use regularly. You can also filter the list by specific parameters such as codecs, frame rate, and resolution. Variable frame rate is available in certain recording qualities and allows you to shoot up to 180 frames per second. Timecode options allow you to see the clip or shoot's timecode on your screen. It will also allow you to output the timecode via HDMI. We'll bypass the focus page as this was covered within the photo section. On the audio pages of the menu, you can set and control the input, output, display and headphone levels for your camera. This all depends on the mic system. So adjust accordingly, but typically you'll want your audio to be peaking, so at its loudest, at about minus six on the bars here. 
any more than that and you'll risk clipping the audio and losing clarity. With the audio page looked at and the adjustments made, that covers the specifics for both stills and video. Now we can move on to setting up the camera's general settings. Many of these settings in the first page are personal preferences, so we'll cover the basic overview of a few of them. Photo style settings is where you can customize your custom photo styles and enable or disable any preset ones that you just won't need. ISO increments are best kept to one third EV, as one EV is usually quite a jump. You can also extend your ISO in the options below to enable more options at the top and bottom of the range. Though these can introduce noise and can slightly affect dynamic range too. Color space is for the type of space you're working in and what you can preview on your computer's monitor. Most monitors will be able to view all of sRGB and only certain monitors have the ability to view all of Adobe RGB. The focus stroke shutter menu again is user preference. If you're unsure as to what to do here, go through an experiment shooting with the different options enabled or disabled to get a custom focus setup that you'll enjoy using. Now one term you may hear as a photographer is back button focusing. It's a good way of pre-focusing before shooting and to do this, you're best to turn shutter AF off. You can then use the AF on button on the rear of the camera to enable your autofocus to start. Now we're going to go through the operation and custom settings for the actual device. This is where you can really make the camera work for you and should keep you from needing to scroll through menu after menu. Don't expect to get this bit right first time as you progress with the camera. You'll likely want to change some of the shortcuts and custom functions as you learn and progress with it. First is the Q menu setting or quick menu setting. You can customize the look as well as which dial controls the menu and even customizing the menu for stills or video. Things to have in your quick menu would be focus peaking settings, bracketing options, recording quality and mic settings. You might also want to put ISO, white balance and other exposure settings there too, even though they have dedicated buttons on the camera. The other big option for customization are the custom function buttons. Unlike many other cameras, the GH52 allows you to customize almost every button on the camera body. So make use of this option and make sure anything and everything you change or use regularly has its own custom button. With filming, I would use options like turning on or off focus peaking, zebras, histograms, and the look or LUT if you're filming in vlog, as well as audio settings. Much like the buttons, you can also customize what your dials do. So if you've moved to Panasonic from a different system, you can set your dials to match that of your old system. You can also choose what you want to have displayed on the GH52's monitor and viewfinder as well. Enabling things like a level gauge, overlays for framing, which we discussed earlier, and other settings like focal length and audio bars. You can also enable markers like center spot as well as waveforms or vector scopes to help with exposure, and enable a look or LUT which will help you when shooting lock, and typically by default is a Rec 709 look. This is only displayed on the monitor and not recorded. A new addition for the Mark II are the frame indicators. One is red, which is for recording, and the other is blue, which is for streaming. These give you a clearer visual indication of when either one of those things is happening. For those of you using an external monitor or recorder, you want to make sure that you've set up the HDMI out settings. Here you can enable or disable the info display and make sure that your recorder or monitor is receiving the correct resolution. You also have further HDMI options available under the HDMI connection submenu. All of these settings can be saved onto an SD card, meaning you can transfer and copy settings across multiple GH52s, or if you're someone who wants to try one by renting, or rents one for specific reasons like gimbal or drone work, then this is a quick way to be able to transfer those workings from one camera to another, and this reduces your setup time. You can also set up a custom menu too, again reducing the time needed for going from one menu to another. 
Key things I would put here would be HDMI settings, card formatting, dual slot functions and Bluetooth connection options. The final part of the camera that I want to cover is the ability to use the GH5 II for live streaming. Now with the demand for live streaming options growing over the past couple of years, the GH5 II makes single camera, home or roaming setups a lot easier. One thing is that you have the ability to use your GH5 II as a replacement for the lacklustre webcam from your laptop, and you can do this in a number of ways. Either using the HDMI out from the camera, and using an HDMI to USB adapter. This camera can then be recognized as a webcam, so on your Zoom, Meet, or Teams calls, you can select this camera from the options. Team this with a little top mic, and you've got the perfect setup for home streaming, or upping your video game for video calls and conferencing. You can also connect straight from the camera via USB to your computer, and use this as a webcam with the help from Panasonic's Lumix software for tethered capture stroke webcam capture. You can also use your mobile device with the Lumix app and Wi-Fi to connect these devices together and stream to almost any platform. The setup and use of all of these options are really quite straightforward to do and really do deliver great results. You can even save your settings and your setup to make sure any future streams or live videos can be done quickly and easily with minimal setup time for each session. Making sure you have good audio and some sort of lighting is then the next steps for mastering the live environment. And this setup isn't just limited to your home. With the use of the mobile app approach, you're able to stream on the go or in almost any location with a mobile connection. And this further elevates your live offering for your clients, colleagues, and viewers. Well, I hope you found this setup guide useful. If you do have any questions about the GH5 Mark II, then don't forget to drop a comment below and the team at WEX will get back to you as quickly as possible. Thanks for watching.